fish in the ocean are owned by the Australian public and they need to know that it's being fished sustainably and sensibly. We've got a social responsibility, it's that simple, you know, we're guardians, guardians of this fishery for future generations. Australia's commercial fishers harvest seafood on behalf of the public and are committed to putting the best Australian seafood on tables now and for generations to come. They work with fisheries managers and scientists to ensure they do this sustainably and in ways we're all proud of. As fishers, they care for the health of our oceans and coastlines. Their livelihood and the livelihood of future generations depends on it. So much so, they've pledged to be transparent and accountable for their actions. Management of our marine environment is a shared responsibility and Parks Australia is working together with fisheries managers and the Australian fishing industry to further support responsible fishing practices. I do think about the future a lot. I want fish stocks to be healthy for the next generation and the generation after that forever. That's why I don't just go out to fill eskies. I think about fish stocks more than making dollars. If you look after the environment, it'll look after you. Parks Australia actively monitors use within Australian marine parks in partnership with other government agencies and by using modern monitoring tools like satellites, GPS-based tracking, and observers out on boats. The Vessel Monitoring System, or VMS, records the position, course, and speed of fishing vessels. This information is monitored in real time by the Australian Fisheries Management Authority to ensure fishers are complying with rules and regulations. It's become an incredibly good management tool, not only for fisheries managers, but for people like myself, a fleet manager, where uh, I need to ensure that everybody's safe and doing the right thing. The management arrangements are strict, but they're in place to ensure that we have the best fisheries management regime in the world. In the Coral Sea, Recent changes to marine park boundaries have posed a challenge to tuna longline operators. The way that longlining work is, is that they deploy a main line which has a number of hooks with baits attached to them. They drift around the ocean and when we want to find the lines, we dial them up on the radio direction finder and that's how we find them. We don't actually have visibility per se of what that line's doing. That's okay if it's out in the open ocean and there's no marine park boundaries in the area, but when we're trying to operate near marine park boundaries, that's where the problems begin for us. When I first saw the software, I, I just knew straight away that it was the solution. At the heart of the longline drift systems that we're testing at the moment, you have GPS beacons which are attached to the long lines. And what they do is they talk to the boat and actually show their position in near to real time as you can possibly get. With this technology, tuner operators can see where their lines are drifting and intervene if they get too close to marine parks. I get everything. I get sea surface hot anomalies, I get currents, I get salinity, I get everything at my fingertips. It's completely changed uh, the industry now. The early results are encouraging and they suggest that there are benefits in this method helping to reduce bycatch as well as helping fishers to catch more fish with less bycatch and less impact on marine parks. Fishermen have to operate in this environment which is inherently variable. So that you go to work today is not going to be the same as any other day you've been at work. And they've got to try and unpack that to run a successful business. And as part of unpacking that, you may say, well, yes, they work out how to catch the fish better. They work out how to catch them efficiently so they can actually make a dollar and make a living out of it. But on the flip side of that, they also work out that there's a level that you can, you can catch that you don't want to go beyond. Because I want to come back and do this tomorrow, I want to come back and do it next year. So they have this appreciation of this environment which they're operating in so we left Caramine. We basically went out to catch a certain amount of a particular fish to fill the orders. And it was one of them days where everything lined up, fish were there, we were at the right place at the right time. We'd put on what we needed for orders plus a couple of extra fish. And I said to Dad, righto, 
that's enough, we've got what we need, wind up. He sort of looked at me a bit funny and he said, no, no, we can fill the eskies up with these fish and make a lot of money. And I said, yeah, but that's not what we're about. As we moved away, it took him a while to, to understand why I'd moved off them fish and left them. They're gonna be there for later. They're gonna breed. A few dollars today is probably a lot of dollars tomorrow. It, it, it was hard for him to understand at the start, that's for sure. You know, it's not only what you do on the reef, it's what you do at home as well, in your whole lifestyle, really. The northern prawn fishery stretches from the top of Queensland to the far waters off Western Australia, and is often referred to as Australia's last wild frontier. The fishery covers 880 square kilometres. However, less than 12% of the waters are fished. They are known for pioneering bycatch reduction devices like the turtle excluder device, and in 2014, they set the ambitious goal of reducing incidental catch. The only problem was, the technology didn't exist. So industry agreed that a 30% reduction was a good target. At the time, a few years ago, 30% was a stretch. It, it sounded like a stretch. I don't think we quite realised the struggle that we might have had to get it done. We had um, quite a few devices developed and they were tested by industry during commercial operation. It has to be able to accommodate all the conditions and the conditions include uh, rough weather, surging tide or the boats turning, the nets are varying. If something looked promising, then we'd get um, scientific trials happening on them. We had to, for the month and a half, I think it was, weigh every shot, every bag. By 2019, the northern prawn fishery had successfully reduced bycatch by close to 50% using their special purpose device known as Tom's Fish Eye. When we got the data, analyse it, it, yeah, it, it turned out to 40, you know, I think it was 44, 45% plus, uh, you know, no prawn loss. When you're used to your nets being a certain size in the tiger fishery, to then have them come up and they're half the size. The prawns are all there, but the fish are getting out. From where we were three, four years ago, to what we've got now, that's, that's pretty amazing. I think we're... We should be very proud of what we've done in this industry. The longline fisheries around Australia, including large tuna and billfish grounds, utilise their own technology to reduce their impact on non-target species, like seabirds. Tory lines are a series of streamers that hang above deployed longlines and represent a physical barrier between the seabirds and baited hooks. At the end of the day, if you've got hundreds of albatross, around your vessel, move. It's that simple. If you've got birds diving on your baits, change your setting time, set an hour after dark. Don't discharge off all while you're hauling. We also use line weights, so our gear sinks very quickly. You can dye your, your squid bait, you can dye it blue. It's not enough just to deploy the toy line and say, right, oh, I've met my legal obligations. That's not what it's about. You know, it's about not catching bloody birds. You know, at the end of the day, albatrosses are the souls of lost sailors. We've got to look after them. Any interaction with threatened, endangered or protected species, otherwise known as TEPs, is important to Australian fishers and is covered by a mandatory reporting obligation overseen by the Australian Fisheries Management Authority. So AFMA has a comprehensive monitoring program in place uh, for interactions with protected species across all of our fisheries. In the past, the provision of accurate and timely information was especially difficult due to the extended period vessels are at sea. Industry has worked hand in hand with scientists and regulatory bodies to develop the capacity of crew members to observe and record non-target data. Initially in 2003, CSRO started up a program to identify the best methods to monitor bycatch. And we came up with a, a, a crew member observer program in conjunction with AFMA observers where crew members monitor record on data sheets what they're catching um, for the whole season. Keeping track of those numbers is probably a 
pretty important thing from an environmental standpoint. Things that are endangered is the main thing, but you know, they also say if you see anything cool along the way, just take photos of that. Sea snakes, crustaceans, um, seahorses, cygnathids. An octopus is another one of my favourites. Every time we have an octopus, we're always like, oh, stop the belt, let's get it back in the water as quick as we can, because they're just so cool. As for the data side of it, we have AFMA observers that go out for their observer trips. We use that data as well to validate the crew member observer data. Getting fisheries management right is a really difficult task and, and trying to do it without very good information is, is almost impossible. The program varies from year to year, anywhere between 1,800 and 2,000 sea days across 14 different fisheries from the Torres Strait in Australia's far north all the way down to Antarctic and sub-Antarctic waters. So AFMA observers are mandatory in the Heard Island and McDonald Island and the Macquarie Island toothfish fisheries so that we really can be sure that we are getting accurate, verified and reliable information. I love it because it feels like at least I'm giving a little bit back, you know, I feel like I'm studying sort of while I'm at sea. I'm doing a little bit more than just my everyday job. I mean, to be a good fisherman, you're really good at observing, you're really good at understanding things that happen in your patch. It's about not thinking about today, it's thinking about tomorrow more than anything. I think when you do that, it, it, today takes care of itself. There are things that evolve in the fishing industry technology sort of space where at one stage nobody used it and 20 years down the track everybody's using it. This is the sort of technology that I would think that maybe in 20 years time is on every boat. The MPF's always been in pursuit of being the best it can be um, and that could be in managing the stock or managing threatened species interactions or bycatch. It's just an endless pursuit to be the best. It's important to note that all marine resources are actually owned by the Australian community. So having in place a robust system to ensure that we're collecting information and then the transparency of, of publishing those is a really good way of living up to that accountability. Australia's oceans are the envy of the world. Our marine park management and our fisheries management are world class and it's vital to ensuring these magnificent marine environments are here now and for us all to enjoy into the future. If we look after the reef, the reef will keep looking after us and it will keep looking after the next generation or the generation after that.